Good morning, everyone. I'm Nayaswami Krishnadas. This is Nayaswami Mantra Devi. We're very happy to be here uh, giving this service here in Sacramento with you. So the dreaded thing happened. I prepared for a different reading. <laughs> I double-checked on that. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what happened, but uh, <clears throat> I thought all the colonies were on the same same children of the light. Yeah, that was a different reading. That's okay. <laughs> Anna Pura, thank you for the reading. Um, I figured it's easier if I just read a little bit of this one so that my talk makes more sense. <laughs> I even checked with Maria, who you all know very well, because she's doing service up in, Sac up in Ananda. Because the Palm Sunday and Easter kind of throws off the, uh, the um, sequence some. So this one, I'm not going to read the whole thing. <clears throat> we are children of the light. And the passage is... Um, it is common for people to perceive themselves according to their present realities. A person in ill health says, I am ill. Few say, I am well. It is my body that is suffering. People in low income brackets say, I am poor. Only the unusual person will say, though outwardly I live in poverty, inwardly I am wealthy. And thus, when it comes to moral and spiritual development, people commonly identify themselves with their weaknesses and their mistakes. They consider it almost a sign of humility to say, I am a sinner. Though, in effect, what this means is that they identify themselves with their sinfulness, not with the soul's power to transcend all limitations in God. The great masters, including Jesus Christ, have always emphasized the divine potential of mankind, to encourage us, they address us as children of the light. So the reading, uh, the Bible passage uh, quoted in, in John, St. John, no man hath ascended up to heaven, it tells us, but him that came down from heaven. This passage continues, even so the Son of Man who is in heaven. So I'll just stop there. The Whispers reading today. Teach me to drown in thy light and live. I come to thee with the song of my smiles. Whatever treasures have lain in the secret, secrecy of my soul, I bring eagerly to thee. I bring thee all the honey from the hive of my heart. All that was ever mine is thine alone. The sunlight of this world shining upon my eager hopes and brief fickle fulfillments burn me repeatedly with dissatisfaction. Now I will quench my thirst forever in thy radiant waters. The taper of my aspiration toward happiness will burst aflame with thy coming into a conflagration of bliss. In thy vast enchanting sea of light, I will swim joyfully forever. Teach me to drown in thee and live, rather than live in a mirage paradise of earthliness and die. I do have some notes, but I'm not going to be able to go way over there and get them. <laughs> so this, uh, this reading today, the basic meaning of it, uh, as Swami Kriyananda writes, is that we are all, that is all of our destiny, each and every one of us in this room. Our destiny is that we will go to heaven. We will ascend from this plane into the higher sphere 
of heaven, some high astral region, because that's where we came from. We came down from there. This is what Jesus is saying. Not that he was the only one that came down, therefore we should listen to him, and he's a perfected being and uh, sort of a singular, uh, singularly made by God to come and teach us the way. He came to show us that we are children of the light, that we are one in that light, and that we only need to improve our knowing and wake up to that reality. And that this physical body of ours is really a projection from an astral body, and then a thought body, and spirit is our essence, our true reality. So in traditional Christianity in the West, they would have us believe that Jesus was the only son, he was, like I said, the only perfected being, and that unless you believe on his name, uh, you will not be admitted to heaven, and that we actually, uh, our destiny would be hell for eternity. So, and there are people that ascribe to that to this day. I don't think anybody in this room does, probably. We favor, as what Yogananda came to teach, the teachings of Sanatana Dharma, preserved more in the Hinduism, that we are, that God is, as you, as you know, ever existing, ever conscious, ever new bliss. God is light. And that we are children, we are made in that image, that's what it means in the Bible. We are made in that image, we are children of light. We've come from that reality. And we are basically uh, trying to make our way back home. We are ignorant of that fact to much, much, uh, to much of the degree that we are steeped in Maya. Maya, it's Maya's job in this world uh, to keep us bound and keep us hypnotized by this mirage that we are uh, limited to this body, mind, our thoughts, and so on, not identifying with the essence of who we are, and that is light. So Yogananda come, the, the masters come, to wake us up, wake us up to that truth. He's the alarm clock. He is the one that says, wake up, even though we lay there in slumber and we turn over and we resist and we wake up sort of incrementally, but he's there to plod us along. There is no satisfaction anywhere along the way, ultimately, until we reach the final beatitude. That's because out of the grace of God and the masters, they don't want us to settle for anything less because why would they, when they know the destiny of all of us and the ultimate fulfillment is bliss absolute, bliss infinite, bliss for eternity? So this is why it's a stacked deck, but in our favor, truly. Not in the ego's favor, but in the soul's favor. So Yogananda says, well, get to know me. Get to know God. God is nearer than a near, dearer than a dear. This is, this is what really all we have to do. But there's a lot of obstacles to that. But if we uh, do the best we can and keep attuned to God and Guru, we will get there. There's a fun little story where uh, there was a child, he was saying his prayers, overhearing saying his prayers, and he said, he's talking to God, and he says, God, are you in Reverend Cole Friends, or do you just know them through business? <laughs> and I'm thinking that that's like us. We, you know, we are devotees. Most here, disciples, kriyabans. You know, we've given our life to this. But how well do we really know the guru? How really well do we know God? Because it's an ever deepening, ever unfolding process that we have to continually work at, and being in that consciousness all the time. Yogananda himself would fight with God. He says, when he would get so busy, he'd say, God, I'm too busy I'll walk, doing lectures and consultations and writing, you know, all that he did. It was just miraculous in and of itself, 
all that he produced in that one incarnation. He said, if, if, if I have to do this and forget you, I don't want to do it. I'll walk away from it. And God spoke to me. He said, don't you see just you not feeling me, thinking of me that you want to feel me more is thinking of me. And then he said he had eight months solid, continuous samadhi, ecstasy, when he had that. that uh. So here we are, children of the light, and we're not necessarily aware of that uh, as often as we would like, right? We're, so we, we believe in the concept, and we believe that, yes, God is light, we are light, but we're not always swimming in that sea, are we, of bliss and aware of the fact that we are, and the truth that we are light. So I'm going to tell a little joke here. Um, how many of you remember Flip Wilson, funny black comedian, okay? Afro-American black, people of color. We have to stay with the times. <laughs> anyway, I, I really enjoyed him. I, I think he passed away not too long ago, so we'll do this in honor of Flip Wilson. Flip Wilson was saying, he, he was talking with an anthrop anthropologist, and the anthropologist was looking at Flip, and he was saying, you know, your skin's black because in Africa, the sun's so hot, it's a protection from the heat of the sun. He goes, oh, okay. And he goes, and you, you could run really fast because you have to get away from all the predators and the, th the wild uh, animals. He goes, okay. He goes, and your hair is cut, you know, cropped tight, curly, because when you're running through the bush, it can't get tangled in all of the, the, uh, the briars, you know. And he goes, oh, okay. He goes, can I ask you a question? He goes, sure, what is it? He goes, what the heck am I doing living in Chicago? <laughs> I always love that joke. It's like, we're, we're supposed to be descended from heaven, you know? We're supposed to be living on this really high level of consciousness all the time. And I'm thinking, well, what the heck am I doing, you know, steeped in this ignorance and living from the ego and doing all kinds of mistakes, you know? Well, it's a process. Obviously, it's a process. So the guru comes and says, you need sadhana. You need scientific techniques of meditation, yoga meditation. And that's how we wake up to this truth and live in this reality. We have to have a regular daily practice of meditation. That's the foundation, Yogananda says. There's no getting around it. Then, you know, these readings do have a flow, and I'm glad we're on this one today. Last week, it was um, reason versus uh, intuition. Because just like early on in the readings where it says, you know, Arjuna was, uh, he wants to see God, but n not until he's given divine sight, because divine sight comes to intuition. Same with this. We, don't re we won't really feel we are children of the light or live on that level of reality unless we meditate daily and, you know, be more here at the spiritual eye and develop our intuitive perception because it's only through our intuitive, intuitive perception that we will even perceive ourselves as being light and living on that level. So daily sadhana is very important. The other is our attitudes. You know, how are we li really living life? Because it's both meditation, sadhana, and our life habits, and so on, our attitudes. So Swami Kriyananda said a, an amazing thing. He said that um, it would be no exaggeration to say that, it, that attitude in the last analysis is everything. That attitude in the last analysis is everything. Because you would think, well, sadhana, as long as I'm meditating and feeling the peace and the joy, but where is your consciousness? Where is your consciousness? Even doing your sadhana, and when you're not doing your sadhana, consciousness, where your consciousness is, is paramount for our spiritual unfoldment. Yogananda gave this beautiful image. He said, meditation is the foundation 
of our life. It should be the foundation. Energization, as you know, the cornerstone. But uh, our attitude, which sets up our thoughts and magnetism, Swamiji said that magnetism is the, uh, the bedrock. That's the bedrock of your life. So getting your, your thoughts aligned with everything. So then again, that, this is, that's a sadhana too. So we have to work on our attitude. We have affirmations, prayer, satsang is important. So let's go through some. Okay, let's say, uh, because it isn't easy and we have to keep plugging away, right? Daily. It's a daily grind, but we try to make it joyful. It should be joyful. A joyful working at this and keeping ourselves uh, buoyed up, you know, from the inertia and all around the pool of maya that wants to keep us down, keep us immersed and hypnotized in our limitations. So let's work with um, a positive outlook. We need to keep a positive outlook. Affirm it, even when you don't feel positive. I was uh, with some others in Mantra Devi and some others. We were visiting Table Mountain. I don't know if you've ever been up there. Table Mountain is where there are acres. And it's like a plateau. Acres and acres and acres of wildflowers. It's the most beautiful. If you've never been there, you can. It has its own website. Uh, I don't know if they're still in bloom now, but uh, it would be worth the trip. So we had been there before. I was anticipating seeing these flowers, this spectacular, you know, beautiful, uh, endless sea of color. So we get out of the car and anticipating it's like an hour and a half drive, and we get out and we're walking through. And and everyone's ooing and aahing, and I'm, I'm seeing nothing but brown. And I'm thinking, did I suddenly go blind, <laughs> colorblind, you know? And, uh, and I realized I had my sunglasses on. <laughs> so I took off my sun, and these glasses, those the ones I had at the time, it wasn't seeing any color, so I took off the glasses, and ah, there it was. You know? So Divine Mother played with me a little. It, there was a delayed reaction for that beautiful. beautiful seen. So, we, you know, what, like, how are you looking at this world? You know, what filters are you looking through? You know, it's, it's habitual of how you perceive and, you know, what, what you, how you look at this world. Another one is, uh, um, it's the second one I was going to mention. Oh, being optimistic. We have to remain optimistic through all the ups and downs, the joys and the sorrows and the, the challenges. And this was a major teaching of Yogananda's, that circumstances are neutral, how we respond, it's positive or negative. So this, uh, I read this cute little story about these twin brothers. So they were, um, one was very optimistic and one was very pessimistic. They were sort of the embodiment of these two opposite uh, um, attitudes. So the parents were, became concerned. So the parents went to a child psychologist and they told him, and he goes, he goes, well, Christmas is coming up. Let's, let's, let's uh, test them this way. He goes, Christmas time, put them in opposite rooms, okay, and give the pessimist all the best toys you can possibly buy them. And in the other room, give the optimum, optimist some manure. So these parents said, okay, we'll try anything, right? Parents do that. They'll try anything if they have to. So they do this. They give the, the one with the, uh, the pessimist, they gave him a computer, and he said, and so they listened in, and he says, this computer isn't the best color for me. And he said, this calculator is probably going to break. And then this toy truck, oh, my buddy Joe has a bigger one than this. You know, so that's he went on and on like that. So they tiptoed across a corridor and they looked, they listened for the pessimist. And they looked in and he's throwing this manure up in the air. He's going, They can't fool me. Wherever there's this much manure, there must be a pony. <laughs> <laughs> so you need to 
be an optimist or a pessimist. You've got to remain optimistic. I mean, we, you know, because as you get going on the path, as you all have been on the path, many of you for a long time, it gets steeper at the top. And our karma un has to unfold. It has to play out. And sometimes people who have been on the path along, it seem like they have a, the most challenge, challenges, or the big challenge, and it could be a challenge for everybody else. <laughs> so we see that, well, this sort of glaring, what we would call accentuated fault, is maybe the last thing, or one of the last. So it's not a bad thing. It's, it's where their heart is. It's, it's if they're trying. You know, no judgment. So this is how we, and Swami Kriyananda, um, in his, uh, his path, he, he describes um, an incident for him, moods. Moods are, moods are a no-no, as you know. Moods are bad. We, ha we can't give in the moodiness because moods contract us. He was, uh, he was greatly anticipating Yogananda coming back from a trip. And so the master uh, arrives and goes up into his, his living quarters. And Swamiji said, well, you know, he could have uh, delegated this job of bringing him some drinking water, but he, he kept it for himself because he wanted to see Master. He missed him. So he brings it up, and he said he, he made as much uh, noise as he possibly could for a job that was, took minimum tumult. I always like that line. So he says, so Yogananda, but Yogananda didn't pay attention. He did not pay attention. He didn't acknowledge him. He just stayed with what he was doing, maybe writing a letter or something. So this threw Swami into a funk. He thought, he didn't even miss me. He didn't even want to see me when he got back. He, doesn't, he thinks I'm a worker. I'm not even a disciple. So he started in this sort of tailspin of this kind of a mood, these thoughts. And then he went to, you know, this is really an uncaring world, and no one really cares about anybody in it anyway. You know, so he's getting bigger. <laughs> now it's the world, you know. <laughs> and so then uh, he thinks, well, well, of course, you know, Master's busy, and he... Uh, has a lot on his mind, and so on and so forth. So he's trying to reason a little bit, and he goes, yeah, but when I came in, he probably saw, there's that worthless disciple, Walter. <laughs> and then he started dictating a letter so I don't have to talk to him. So Swami <laughs> realized that reason wasn't working. So he said he went down into his meditation cave, and he threw his mind at the point between the eyebrows, and he, and he meditated. And he said it only took five minutes. And his energy lifted, his attitude changed, he came out of that mood and said, of course, Master is very busy, has so many responsibilities, I know that he cares. So the next time he sees Yogananda, Yogananda says, you know, I suffer when you have moods, because I see that Satan has got hold of you. The guru suffers for us, in a sense, when we fall into moods, because he doesn't want us to be in a mood cut off from the bliss and joy that he came to bring us and tell us that we're one with and he's trying to give it to us. So I'm not going to make Master suffer on my account, and I know none of you want to either. So we have to lift from any kind of moodiness. Um, and just lastly, I was thinking of uh, perseverance. We have to persevere. We have to stay at it. Everybody that accomplished anything uh, has been through perseverance. It hasn't been easy. If, it, if they're great, they persevered. I was reading about some people, some, you know, not necessarily reaching the heights of spirituality, but fulfilling their destiny. Woody Allen was um, flunked out of movie production. Both New York uh, University and the College of New York City, and he failed English. 
The Beatles were asked to leave the studio because Decca Records thought, well, they're not going to go anywhere. They weren't very talented, and guitars were really going out. <laughs> I was thinking of the people that made these decisions, too, though, you know. <laughs> and then Lucille Ball, she was told she had, uh, uh, that she should try any profession except the acting, any. <laughs> you know? Elvis Presley was told he had no talent. After his first per performance, he was told, you know, you don't have any talents, kid. Why you, you better get back to truck driving. Now, these are sort of on a more movie star level. But Abraham Lincoln, he entered the Black Hawk Wars as a captain. By the time it was over, he demoted all the way down to private. <laughs> and the other thing about him is, if you, if, I don't know if you ever read this, he ran for office 10, 12, for tw 10 or 12 times, Senate and this and that, and failed every time, was not elected until he was president. Now, anybody else would have given up. I mean, you know, that's a rare soul. And obviously, it was his destiny to, to be president during that very um, difficult period of our history. But there are many people like that. One more, Pablo Casals is the like, preeminent cellist. The, probably the greatest in the world, and he's uh, 80 years old or something like that. And a reporter said, well, why, why do you still practice six hours a day? And, you know, you're the greatest cellist in the world that's ever known of all time. He said, he goes, well, I think I'm progressing. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you one more. Um, Thomas Edison, he was... Uh, they asked him to leave school. He was very unintelligent. They thought, you know, he didn't have much concentration. He was a problem child. They, they removed him from school. His mother thought, I'll homeschool him, as we say today. So she took over. And then in, at 10, he built his own chemistry set. And then at, I think he's credited with 1,300 inventions. He's the greatest inventor that I think in US history. And on the light bulb alone, which you probably heard, he did 2,000 experiments to before he, he, he discovered, made it work. So a reporter asked me, he goes, how did it feel to fail that many times, 2,000 times? He goes, I didn't fail at all. I invented the light bulb. It was a 2,000 step process. <laughs> <laughs> so we're a, pro we're a uh, how do you say, you know, we're, we're, a, we're in process. You know, we're, we are in the making of being saints and actual realizing more and more of the time and living from that level that is our true reality. We are children of the light. And you wouldn't be here if you hadn't been feeling this. And at times it's blissful and lovely and then karmic bombs and a little bit of, you know, rough weather hits. That's, that's life, right? That's how it is. So we have to just keep persevering, persevering. All of these is the life of the devotee. And then when we do wake up, and however good we are, I, you know, I look at samadhi and I say, wow, that's wonderful. That's a lot. Uh, then I think about where I'm at. Then, on the other hand, Yogananda says, you meditate a little bit, just a little bit every day, and we do more than that. You go to a high astral realm, full of light. So let's concentrate on the positive, be optimistic, persevere, and we will get there. <laughs> let's meditate briefly.